Hey, everybody. Can you all hear me? Your thumbs up there, Crystal. Okay. Well, welcome aboard. Uh oh, I lost you. Right, there you are again. All right. Um, so everybody doing okay with their homework and everything? Gavin, are you doing all right with your uh, Ford web-based stuff? Yeah, I'm doing all right with it. Okay. Those aren't bad courses in this class. The the gas engine course are kind of they're kind of brutal, but these these ones are pretty good. All right. So if you guys don't have any concerns about class right now, then I'm going to take us into a PowerPoint here on Huey injectors. And I didn't did that again. Yeah, let's. All right. <clears throat> Crystal, you fell off the screen. It's because I'm, I'm eating a meal. It's okay. Stay on there because it's, it's easier to talk when there's somebody. Okay. What are you eating today? <laughs> broccoli and fish. Didn't you eat broccoli and fish on Sunday or on Tuesday? Is that all you eat? Or is it all leftovers? Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. So we're going to talk about Huey injection systems today. The Huey stands for hydraulically actuated, electronically controlled unit injector. Okay. That's a whole bunch of words and everything. And we're going to, we're going to by the time you're done with this, you're going to know how these things work. But in the middle of it and in the beginning of it, you're going to think I'm that you're losing your mind and and I'm yeah, it's, it's, it, they're kind of out there and, and we're going to try to bring it all together. But if you guys have any concerns with it, if you don't get it, ask me, cause it's, this is, these are really important to know, especially Gavin, you're going to, if you want to go work on Kenworth or going to go work on big stuff, um, uh, Caterpillar was the company who invented this. Um, and, uh, and I, we don't use it anymore. We haven't used it since 2000. 10. No, I'm sorry. That's wrong. Yeah. 2010, we had it still in the Econoline. Um, but as far as I know, Caterpillar still uses it. And I could be wrong on that, but um, as far as I know, they do. Um, so with, I guess, let me just say that, that with the problems that they were facing with diesel engines was the fact that old injection systems, if you remember with our high pressure system, we were talking about on, on Tuesday, they were injector pumps were mechanically run off of camshafts or a pump that had a cam inside itself. And it was a mechanical pump or cam that ran a mechanical piston and everything was, everything was mechanically done. So if the engine ran at slow speeds, it put out low pressure. If it ran at high speeds, it put out high pressure, but they didn't have the ability to put out high pressure at any speed. So, so they were faced with this dilemma of diesel engines that ran and did what they wanted them to do, but they polluted, they polluted heavily and they, they wasted fuel and there was just all kinds of things wrong with them. Okay. So they needed to come up with a way to computer control these things. They were, I, I, I know that Cummins had played with just regular old, you know, inline injection pumps and electronically controlling them and doing all kinds of stuff. It just made an old system a little better, but they didn't come up with a new system. Caterpillar in 1991 or wherever it was that they invented this, we used it, we, we introduced it in 1993. Um, they um, were able to come up with a, 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 an effective way to create the high pressures we needed at any speed. We could, we could make an injector that could um, uh, give us an injection timing rate and, 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 and injection rate that we could tailor to the, to the cylinder to make it uh, more efficient. And, and we could change the timing of it to any timing we wanted to. Okay. And what that ended up with was a 99% reduction in NOx gases coming out to the tailpipe. Now we've talked a little bit about NOx gas early on in this, and we'll talk, 
more about what Knox is in a few weeks when we get into the after treatments. But Knox are nitrogen that's been oxidized. In other words, there's this nitrogen particle that's got an indiscriminate amount of, of oxygen molecules attached to it. It happens at high temperatures and under high pressure. And that's what happens in a diesel is we're firing it under high pressure and high temperatures. Okay. <clears throat> but if we can do things to reduce the amount of high pressure that we're, that that's happening in the, you know, during the injection process or during the combustion process, we can control that. And uh, that's what we're doing with these uh, Huey injectors. And you can see this, I'm gonna try to move you guys down. You're sitting in my, there you go. Um, just some different kinds of injection uh, ramping that we do. Uh, we have a, you know, we can, we can, I'll just start here with the square wave. We can turn injector on and then we could turn it off, you know, so you just have a square wave injection coming in there, but we can ramp it so that it's kind of a variable pressure and then it ramps off a little bit. We can have, you know, big heavy ramps and, and, and slow ramps at the end. We can have pilot injection. We talked about last week where we give a little injection and then we, then we, you know, give a big injection after that. And we have post combustion events we can do. And these are just, you know, charting how those injectors work. And with this, with a Huey system, we can do this. With a old mechanical system, we didn't have the ability to do that. When that thing was going to inject, it just injected fuel. And that was just the way it was going to be. Um, Uh, I don't need to talk about this slide at all. Um, <clears throat> okay, so how we're going to do this in a Huey is we're going to use high pressure oil. We're going to use engine oil pumped up at high pressure to hydraulically actuate these injectors. Now, if you bear, bear with me on this, I've got some, I've got three really good animations that we're going to get to, and it's really going to explain how all this works, but we're going to work through some slides here to try to, um, explain all this to you so that you get a handle on what we're doing here. Um, the advantages of the Huey system is the hydraulic system pressurizes the fuel. In other words, we're going to use hydraulics to, to run the injector rather than a mechanical cam running a piston. We're going to use hydraulics to run the piston. Um, Huey systems develop peak pressures at any engine speed. Okay. In other words, we don't have to have we can do it at low speed, high speed, whatever we want to do, we can make those pressures happen. So we don't, we're not relied, we're not reliant upon engine speed to make the high pressures. Um, we can instantly adjust the fuel pressurization. We can, we can, we can change how it injects the fuel in a, in a fraction of a second. All the electronic controls of it um, help us be able to do that. Now, keep in mind, this is an older system. We don't use it anymore because the new common rail systems work immensely better than these, but these still work really good. And they were the first uh, generation to it. So just kind of comparing the Huey to an old injector pump, this is, you know, this is what we were talking about. A camshaft would come around, it would push this piston up. As Soon as this piston passed this port here, it would start injecting fuel. You couldn't change it. All they did was inject a certain amount of fuel. We would change how much fuel got into that uh, chamber, but we couldn't really affect its timing or anything like that. It was pretty, you know, it was the, the rate of that fuel and everything was just set by the injector pump. Well, I'm going to show you in a minute how with the, with the Huey, we are able to um, change the rate of fuel and everything that's going on inside there. So if we were to chart out a standard old injector pump, as the engine RPM went up, so would the injection pressure, okay? But with the Huey system, we can have that high pressure at very low engine RPM and we can maintain it. And that that is the advantage, because remember, we're trying to, we need those high pressures to be able to penetrate that mass, you know, that, that air mass that's inside that cylinder. Because remember what we're trying to do is we're trying to inject that fuel. We want to get it in. It's got to get into a high pressure mass. We need it to, to distribute through the cylinder. We need it to uh, atomize so it can absorb the heat, vaporize, and fire. And if 
and one of the things that these things couldn't do was it, it was it couldn't do that at lower RPMs. So how we're going to do that is we're going to use hydraulic force from engine oil to drive a piston to inject the fuel. Okay, this is just a kind of a kind of a silly animation of a hammer, you know, as the force to push down on this piston. And um, I guess now is as good a time as any to explain what's happening here. So this is a this is a standard nozzle. Remember we talked about nozzles the other day. This whether it's on a Huey on an old time system, whether it's on a common rail system, every diesel engine is going to have the bottom portion of this in some variation. Okay. And this is just a nozzle. What has to happen with this nozzle is somehow we have to pressurize fuel. This dark purple in here is fuel under pressure. As this piston comes down here, it's going to raise that, you know, pressure up to somewhere around, um, you know, in the 20,000 PSI range. And that fuel comes down here and works against the seat and lifts this off its seat, working against the spring pressure and injects the fuel. As soon as the pressure goes away, the spring pressure comes down and it shuts and it seals this pintle in here, seals everything from the combustion chamber. So the big question is, how do we make this high pressure fuel? Well, in a Huey system, we're going to introduce oil on top of a piston here. See this amplifier piston right here? They actually, they're going to use the term amplifier piston or intensifier piston interchangeably. I've tried to, I've tried to in most of the literature that you're reading, get rid of the word amplifier piston because Ford, use, Ford terminology is it's an intensifier piston. But either way, what it is is that if you... Do you understand the ideals, the, the principles, hydraulics at all, Crystal? Have you been introduced to the, okay. Yeah. So, so this, in this one here, it's an eight to one ratio, but in all of the Ford injectors, it's a seven to one ratio. So this piston is seven times bigger than this piston here. So if we're going to put, if we put a thousand pounds of pressure, of oil pressure against this piston up here, we'll have 7,000 pounds of fuel pressure below. Does that make sense? That's just simple hydraulics. And that's how this, that is the, that is the magic of the Huey system is we are gonna drive, we're gonna use hydraulic pressure to push on this amplifier piston that's gonna push on the plunger and build the pressure. By doing that, we can change we could change that oil pressure from anywhere from 500 to some systems clear up to 4,000 PSI. So if you had 4,000 PSI available to you and you put 4,000 PSI up here, you'd have 28,000 pounds of fuel pressure at the injector. Okay. So we can, we can make all those changes to that. And, and in a, in the split second, just based on changing that pressure in that, uh, a uh, high pressure oil system. Um, I think we just explained that high pressure is used to inject the oil or fret fuel. Okay, because again, our goal is to get high pressure, highly atomized fuel into the combustion chamber. We need to be able to do that. Um, one of the, one of the advantages of the Huey systems is the injectors are a unit kind of injector. In other words, the injector itself is just a big fat unit that sits in there. And so that unit is interchangeable amongst, you know, between a wide variety of, of vehicle applications. They might be able to take that same injector and use it in several vehicles with just maybe changes a couple of internal pieces and, and changing it, or they may be able to use the same injector across a bunch of vehicle lines and just change the hardware or the software in the, in, in the computer. So they're a really nice uh, compact design. Now there's, we're gonna talk about, there's three different kinds that we're gonna talk about today. Two of them are kind of large, but the, the, the um, Gen 2s are extremely small. And so they can, we have a lot more 
space available to us to put more valves in the engine. And that's what they use those for. Um, so uh, we can, by having the ability to, to change the rate of fuel and how it's coming in and all of that stuff and change the slopes of how it's firing, we're not only changing the, uh, not the NOx emissions, but we're also able to, um, with that split shot injection and all that, we can reduce the noise that's um, happening inside the combustion chamber. Chris, you were asking the other day about, you know, what makes that cracking noise. Remember, it was that a, a big slug of fuel in, in, in an old injector pump, you know, as, as the fuel went in, it was just a big slug of fuel going in there. And, and it would, it would delay and delay and delay. And then all of a sudden it would get hot enough. It would absorb enough heat and boom, it would go. And so you had this, this loud crack that would take place. So with, with split shot injection and pilot injection and all these different kinds of rate sloping that we can do, we can get that fire to happen uh, evenly and smoothly. So we don't, we lose that, that cracking noise when quiet these things down quite a bit. Okay. So um, this, we talked on Tuesday about pilot injection and split shot. Uh, we're going to really got some really good animations to show how this takes place, but this is just another chart. You know, this thing's going to, shoot off a I'm pointing at with my finger and you can't see me point at with my finger can I can you um <laughs> so the we'll we'll shot we'll shoot a little bit of fuel out and then we'll shoot the main injection and that's all those things are going to do is to help reduce emissions and clean up um uh, quiet them down and then we can also fire off some post injection events to help reduce soot out the tailpipe um And uh, we don't need to talk about that. We talked about that already. Um, all right. So Ford introduced it in their 7.3 engine in, uh, in 1993. And uh, with from 1993 to probably 96, 90, oh, I'm sorry, to 99, early 99s, we had just a regular Huey A. And then in late, mid-year 99 and later on the 7.3s we had the Huey B which had a split shot injector and then uh, and then the six liter got the gen twos that were um, all the way up until uh, 2008 and then it, all the way up to 2010 in the Econolines. Um, we also used the gen twos in the 4.5 that you'll find in the low cab forwards from 2005 to 2008. Um, after 2008, all, all the engines that were built for the, the Econolines up to 2010, this is an interesting fact that you really don't need to know about, but in, uh, in 2008, January, I'm sorry, in January of 2007, all engines had to have um, the DPF it had to have to have an exhaust filter and they had to meet certain emission standards. Okay. So we started introducing those 2008s in January of 2007. Any engines that we built, any units that we built prior to January, 2007. So if we built 10,000 units in December of 2006, for that 2008 model year that was going to be delivered in January 2007, so for every for every engine that we built and truck that we sold or we were able to build before that, we got a credit that we could build a one that didn't comply after that. So we were we built enough before that date that we could continue to sell, build, and sell six liter Econolines all the way to 2010. Does that make sense? So we got credits for building things early when we didn't need to, so we could build six liter Econolines all the way to 2010. It was kind of a goofy thing. Just a bit of trivia that is just kind of out there. Um, but in 2008, we introduced the 6.4 with our first uh, Siemens um, common rail system. And we're gonna talk about that on next Tuesday. So, <clears throat> We built more than two and a half million 
7.3 liter engines <clears throat> with that with the early Huey systems. So there's a lot of them out there. I even got one in today that's from a, a 1995. Um, we I I regularly work on 7.3s. There's just a ton of them out there, and they're you know I there's you know there's some out there with really low miles, but I work on them. They've got you know in excess of four or five hundred thousand miles on them and still running pretty good. Um, so they're, if you, if you took care of this engine and, uh, changed its oil, kept a good air filter in it, they just went forever. So the components of the, of the system, and we're going to kind of, I'm just going to give you a little overview of them right now, but we'll, um, we're going to get in depth of them a little bit here later tonight, but we have the Huey injectors. We obviously have the low pressure oil system. We have the high pressure oil system, and there's a electronic control system that runs them. Okay. But there is also the low pressure supply system, which we talked about on Monday that, or Tuesday, that supplies the, the system with the fuel that it needs. And the low pressure systems on these are usually going to supply the Huey system with somewhere around, somewhere between 50 and 70 PSI, with 60 being most normal is what you're going to see is about 60 PSI. The um, 6.5. O liter was uh, originally they wanted you to keep it around 43, but we found out and we could we could raise the pressure up. If we could raise it up above 50, we had a lot uh, happier injectors and a lot happier system. So these are the injectors. We have there are four variants. Ford only uses three, so I got you can kind of see on my screen over there. I got kind of got blocked the fourth one out because we don't care about that in this class but we have a Huey A, we have a Huey B, and then we have the Gen 2, okay? The Huey A was up, used from 1993 up to about mid-year 1999, and then from 99 to 2003, we had the Huey B, and then in uh, the 6 liter and the 4.5, we used the Gen 2s. So um, the Huey A has a black, it's identified with a black solenoid on the top, uh, and we'll, we'll break down what all this is in a little bit, but this is the, uh, the solenoid, the electric solenoid that's on top. It's black on the Huey A. Um, it has no split shot or pilot injection. It's just a straight up injector. Uh, the Huey B has a white uh, top and uh, in, it is a split shot. Now, having said that, uh, you will get remanufactured injectors that could have uh, any color top on them anymore the, because of all, because of the, that solenoid worked the same no matter whether it was on a B or an A. It's just they used a different color to identify them, but it, you could end up with any color in, injector anymore. So that may or may not be true all the time. Okay. And then the uh, Gen 2 is a completely different injectors, way more slender, although you can't really tell here, but it is a way more slender injector. This one's probably nearly two inches around, maybe, no, maybe not that many, inch and a half. And these might be an inch around. So they're you know half the size. And instead of having a big magnetic coil up here, we have two, uh, an on and off coil that we're, we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, the two solenoids on that Gen 2 makes it, a, they call it a, a digital injector, and it, and it operates a whole lot faster than the uh, early, earlier models, okay? Uh, the A and B use, if you can see in here, this is a really good picture of this, is that this pink O-ring separates the oil from the fuel. What happens in here you see in here is as this injector sits in the cylinder head, high pressure oil is through a galley in the cylinder head, and then fuel sits in a galley in, in the cylinder head. So that's how, uh, where did it go backwards here? That's how fuel and oil are delivered to this injector. And this pink O-ring in here, in the beginning when they first built this engine, we probably went through five different generations of O-rings because <clears throat> we had lots of problems with this O-ring failing. Because remember, you could have as much on this engine, you could have as much as 3,000 
PSI of oil pressure above this O-ring up here. And so they, they had to work real hard to finally develop an O-ring, a ring that would sit in here that would keep the oil out of the fuel and stop it from being a problem. The other thing that this thing has, I think we'll talk about it here in a minute, is, is um, they talk about here, top of the, yeah. The top O-ring, there's a, this top O-ring in here, it sits right here, you can kind of see it. There's a, a blue O-ring that sits here, and then there's a square cut O-ring that sits behind it, and then there's a steel, steel ring that sits above that. So that this keeps this, keep this really stable so that we don't, because what happens you can have, if this leaks, it's just gonna leak that high pressure oil back into the crankcase, but you'll have a high pressure oil leak. Um, on the bottom here of the injector, they're gonna put a copper washer and that copper washer is gonna seal against the bottom of the chamber that this thing's sitting in to keep the compression gases from coming in. If this copper washer fails, compression gases can work up through here and they'll eat this O-ring here and then fuel can run down in the cylinders and it just becomes a big disaster. Um, I think we just talked about this. The injectors held down by, I think you can see it on here, two hold down bolts. There's a, this kind of hooks as this goes in, uh, it'll hook, it hooks on a bolt on this side and then a bolt goes through on this side. So two, it sits between two bolts and kind of clamps it down. Um, so how these things work is the, it's the solenoid that's on the top of that thing, that electric solenoid on a, on the 7.3 on those Huey A and B are energized with 115 volts DC. Okay. That will kill you. they the wires are wrapped in red and, uh, it's important that you don't uh, go poking around on a running engine. When they're off, when the engine's off, there's no voltage there. It's not a big deal. But if the engine's running and that voltage becomes exposed to you and you touch it, uh, high DC current voltage causes cardiac arrest. So it's important that you don't go poking around with a test light or anything like that, trying to find a problem. And we really don't have a lot of high voltage problems like that. So it's not that big a deal, but um, just know that when you are working on one of those and you see the wire, the harness wrapped in red, red tape, um, it's kind of striped tape, know that that's, um, that you have high voltage in there. Um, so that high voltage solenoid controls a poppet valve on the top of the injector and that poppet valve controls the amount of oil going into the injector, okay? The intensifier piston and plunger multiplies the oil pressure and then works against the nozzle to uh, produce the fuel pressure we need so that the nozzle can then uh, atomize and distribute the fuel, just like, just like any other nozzle. So here's a good picture of a nozzle. So when we, we're gonna introduce 115 volts here and we're gonna, all we're gonna do is ground that 115, we're gonna supply it and then ground it and then that's going to, it's a super strong magnet that's going to pull this up. When this gets pulled up, it's going to seal on the top and seal this out from the vent. It's going to open this poppet valve right here. And this oil, high pressure oil is going to come in here. Now it can enter in here and it's going to push down on this piston. When it pushes down on this piston, if we have, we'll, we'll just stick with a thousand PSI and it's a seven to one piston. So as we are as we put a thousand PSI here, we're gonna put 7,000 PSI here. That's gonna come in here. It's gonna offseat this uh, little check ball here and it's gonna come down here. It's gonna inject the fuel. When we de-energize it, pressure is gonna stop here. Fuel that we have coming in here is going to um, refill this chamber, this spring, is going to push this uh, intensifier piston back to the top. This because when this came down here, when we de-energized, we stopped this poppet valve, and that off seat this seat here, and all this high pressure oil that was in there just vented off to atmosphere into the valve cover. 
Okay. So that's, that's it in its simplest form, how it works. There's a, an actual picture of one. Uh, you can see it's kind of a cutaway. I don't know how really how good this is, but you can see, you can see this is the poppet valve seat. And uh, as this, as the magnet pulls this thing up, it just seats, it seats this and seals it up on the top, opens this up and the high pressure oil just pushes on this against the pumping plunger. Um, so the fill cycle, this is, the, this is the stages of the Huey injector. So we have the fill cycle, uh, the in, uh, injection cycle, and then the end of injection. So there's three stages. So the fill, we're going to, the lower seat of the poppet valve uh, um, blocks off the high pressure from coming in there. It allows the fuel to fill up the low pressure, the, the chamber inside the, uh, where the uh, plunger is. And no electric current is applied to the solenoid and it just fills up. Everything's ready to go. Then we have, I'm not really sure why that slides there. And we have the injection stage, which is we're going to energize the solenoid. That's going to open up that, it's going to pull up that um, poppet valve. It's going to work against this, uh, the spring pressure there. And it's going to let the oil come in um, past the poppet valve and it's going to hit that intensifier piston and push down and start injecting the fuel. Okay, and at the end of injection, um, we're going to de-energize that solenoid. It's going to vent that oil back out and stop the oil flow from coming in, and we're going to stop the injection. So here's just a picture of the fill cycle where this is closed, no oil to it, and the pressure, um, I mean, I'm sorry, the fuel's coming in here and just fills this chamber up. And then the injection cycle, when this is on, oil pressure comes down here, seals up here so that this becomes under pressure, pushes down on the piston, we inject oil, our fuel. And then the end of injection, um, we bring that back down, that vents that oil off and injection stops. Um, just another picture of it vented. Okay, so metering. <clears throat> Plunger travel and length determines the amount, quantity of fuel coming in. And I have a pretty good uh, animation here that'll kind of explain that a little bit more. But the, the length of travel on that plunger is going to determine how much fuel goes in. So if it only if we only move it a little bit, only a little bit of fuel is going to come in. But if we really stroke it, you're going to get a lot of fuel in there. Um, and that's all going to be dependent upon how long we leave the injector on and how much oil pressure is in there. So we can, we can change all kinds of things to change the rates of things so that we can have, we can have a little bit of oil pressure and a lot of on time or a lot of on time and a lot of oil pressure. We can, we can, we can mess around with all kinds of things because it's independent. This is working independent of anything mechanical on the engine. We can control all this stuff with a computer to make it, to tailor it to exactly what we want it to do. Okay. So longer solenoid energizing, energizing, leads to greater fuel injection. We can, we can have um, higher oil pressures. That's going to change the rate at which that fuel goes in. And we have lots of control over what's happening with that uh, fuel going in the cylinder. Okay. We can mess with the timing because uh, we can turn that injector on anytime that we want. So we're not, we're not uh, um, limited to what's happening mechanically we can inject that time fuel anytime that we want so that we can, you know, whether it's cold or hot or whatever, we can, we can get the combustion timing exactly with what we're looking for to minimize, um, maximize power, maximize fuel economy and minimize emissions. Um, the injection rate, the quantity of fuel injected per degree of crankshaft rotation. In other words, in other words, how fast, it's going in. Remember, we, we, we saw those, those charts where we can, you know, we can turn it all on right now, or we can ramp it up, you know, and, and slow down the rate at which it comes in. So we can, we can, what we're doing by changing the rate at which it's going in is we're, we can change that. So we're not making super high peak pressures. So we get the burn and we get the power that we need, but we don't get it all at one time. We, we move it out over a length of, you know, crankshaft rotation and we're talking and i'm not talking a long times i'm talking about you know 
10, 20 degrees of crankshaft rotation, something very small, but, but it, it causes it to, we don't get those super high peak combustion temperatures and pressures. So we don't produce the emissions, you know, the high emission levels that we were getting before. So it's all designed to help reduce emissions, give us better fuel economy, give us better power and keep the engine quieter. Um, changing oil pressure affects the rate without changing the time the ejection is on. So we can, you know, we can be on, but we can change the pressure. So it's, again, it's just got all kinds of things that it can do with it. Um, I don't think you need any more of that. Okay, so here's a really good animation. This is a Huey A injector. So you can tell when it's energized there, energized we put high pressure oil in and right now we're only injecting a little bit of fuel but give it a second here we're going to turn on to high and watch watch that piston now see now see how much further down it's moving how much more fuel we're giving it okay so we can give it a little bit of fuel a lot of fuel we can tailor it to whatever we want to do okay so we've got really have the ability to manage the fuel system here. You guys see how that works? Does that make sense to everybody? because it's getting a bit more complicated with the next injector. Crystal, you get it? Yeah. It's, it's, it's complicated as I'll get up, but at the same time, it's, it's brilliantly simple, you know, that, that they're able to do that. So that's a Huey A injector. So the Huey, the only difference between the Huey A and the Huey B is that the Huey B is a split shot uh, prime injector. Remember that we talked about the split shot or the prime was that we have two injection events. We can, we can have that split injection event in the beginning so that we can start the injection or start the flame propagation across the top of the piston and then have the made injection so that we, it, it causes that burn to happen much more evenly and a lot quieter. Um, and it, it, by, by reducing those peak um, combustion pressures, we're naturally going to lower the NOx emissions out the, out the tailpipe. And it gives us less particulate matter going out the tailpipe. Um, so the split shot was strictly designed to help reduce the emissions for the emission standards. As time progressed, they kept, you know, making more and more stringent standards. And so it was critical that they come up with some kind of an idea to do that. And that's what they did here. Um, the timing of the injection doesn't change with the split shot. It just, it's just how they get that, uh, that flame to burn inside the cylinder. The injectors are not interchangeable. They will, they will physically work in each other's engine. But if you put a, if you put a, a non-split shot injector into a split shot injector engine, it'll knock like crazy because it's dumping all the fuel at once and the computer's trying to do something else with it. Uh, likewise, if you put a split shot in the other one, it, it, it does, the, it, the engine doesn't know what to do with it and it just doesn't run right. Um, so how it gets its um, split shot, there's holes in the piston, in the intensifier piston that are, that, will bleed into a, a machined groove. And, and I, I don't need to talk about it. You'll see pictures of it here in a minute. It'll make, make much more sense to you. Um, there was something else. Oh, here, here's um, a fun fact that you need to know. Um, the split sot injectors that are in the 1999 and a half all the way to 2003 engines, the cylinder number eight, of those um, seven three engines, get what they call a long lead. They call it a long lead injector only because it's not a split shot. They put a regular injector in cylinder eight. 
And the reason they put a regular injector into cylinder eight is because the cylinder eight is the last cylinder in all the line of all the everything with that gets any fuel back there. And it, so it's fuel pressure back there is, um, has, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't have as much fuel pressure. So when you put a split shot injector back there, it messes with cylinder eight and it can't fire properly. So they put a regular injector in cylinder eight and all the rest of them get a split shot. I'm not the engineer. I just work on them. So here is a picture of the intensifier piston in, in, I'm sorry, not the, in, uh, this is the plunger, the regular um, plunger in a um, uh, split shot injector and see it has these, all these holes inside here and they are open to a groove in here. Okay. And that'll make a sense here in a second. Um, I don't think I need to talk about it. Let me just show you. Okay. So these holes in here, and you can see they, they put them as lines here, but they're really solid all the way around here. But as this thing, um, as these, as this piston comes down here, as it passes this groove, it dumps the fuel because it'll start injecting fuel. But then as soon as this groove hits this groove, it stops. So it injects a little bit of fuel and then the pressure goes away. And then as this, as this plunger continues to travel past this port, it starts to make pressure again. And just bear with me. I got a good animation. It'll make more sense in a second. Um, well, this is a really good picture of it. So as, uh, as the piston starts to come down, you'll see it, it's making pressure. The heart, the dark purple is pressure. And as soon as it passes this line, all that fuel that's in here dumps out these ports and it stops making pressure. And then as it passes this port again, it starts making pressure again. So you end up with that ramp to, or that, you know, if you remember, remember you had that, that injection that went up and then, then you had your main injection. So you get that pilot injection. Uh, so that's going to reduce, we've already talked about why we do it. So, okay. So here's a picture of it. So if you see there, see how the, watch the injection, you got a little shot and then a big shot. And what's happening is, I'm not sure if I can stop this picture. If I can stop, I don't know if I can stop it in the right there. See, as it, as it moves down and the pressure that's under here is able to dump, it dumps back into the fuel rail. And then as it continues down, it starts to make more pressure again. Does that make sense? And that's the split shot, boom. The rest of the entire system is exactly the same as a regular injector. It just has that, it has that groove cut in there and those holes that just dump that fuel out that vent hole. Crystal, does that make sense? You have a confused look on your face. So what's the main difference? The main difference is that the other one didn't have this split shot. So what, it, well, let's let it back up here a second now. See, watch the injection here at the bottom. Look at, you have a little bit and then a lot. A little bit and then a lot. So every time that injector fires, it's, it fires a little shot of fuel and then a big shot. That's that pilot injection. Remember, you would see it in the, um, 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 let me see if I can, let me see if I can annotate here real quick. So I'm gonna draw a line. See if I can do this. So you would have, you know, the injection, you'd have this little bit of injection and then you'd have the big injection event, okay? And that's what's happening there is the fuel is going to come out. You're getting a little fuel and that little bit of fuel is coming out. It, it atomizes and, and collects heat, vaporizes and, and, and combusts 
real fast. So now you got a flame going across the top of the piston. And then after you, now you've got, now you've got an active flame happening inside the cylinder. And then you put all the rest of the fuel inside there. And it, and what that does is it causes that other fuel to, to atomize and distribute and vaporize and catch and catch on fire much quicker and without a delay and much more evenly so that we don't have that traditional diesel crack. You know, every time, every time a diesel starts in the morning or something, you hear that cracking noise and it's they're really knocking, knock, 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 knock. You know, we get rid of that because we are controlling that flame in the cylinder through this, through this, uh, um, If I can find my, oh, I can't find my, there it is. Through this split shot, that's the difference in between the A and the B, is that the B has this split shot capability, okay? It's, it's important. So then... We have Gavin and Arturo. Do you guys understand what's going on there? Yeah, it's actually making a surprising amount of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. And these animations were really good. It, it took me hours to figure out how to steal these animations out of the book and get them into my PowerPoint. But I did it for you guys. <laughs> but Thanks. but. But these really, I mean, this just really explains how the injector works and how that split shot, because that is that split shots, you know, is an inch, it's just an interesting design and, and it works, but it's a very fixed design. It doesn't, they can't, they, I mean, they can change the rate and they can change you know, how much fuel they're putting in um, and they can do a lot of that, but they can't change that pilot, you know, that, that split, when it fires that split, it only does it you know, one time it can't control it beyond that. So the limitations to the Huey A and the Huey B are that this, that this, um, let me go back to find one, is that this solenoid, when it turns on, it's a big fat magnet. And when it turns off, it just releases a magnet. So it, it didn't have a whole bunch of control that, um, that, that the Gen 2 is going to have, which I'm going to show you here in a second. Let me See if I can, uh, I got to find an eraser and get rid of that uh, red stuff there. Okay. So, so then we're going to get to the Gen 2s here. The Gen 2s are, they're going to call them a digital injector um, because the way they're using the poppet valves, a, a, a different kind of a, um, a, they're using a spool valve rather than a poppet valve. And they're using it kind of back and forth. And it's an interesting they have um, four coil or four external pins. They're going to use an on-off circuit on a, on two different coils. We're going to use 48 volts at 20 amps as opposed to the uh, 115 volts. So these are a lot um, lot safer system. Uh, they take way shorter time to energize than the 115 volts. Um, they're smaller, so they can use uh, you know they can use four intake or two intake valves, two exhaust valves. So we can breathe this engine a lot better. We use, uh, I'll show you, but we're using, they, they use residual magnetism in these solenoids to help move these things. Um, some really advanced designs and there's some real um, proprietary metals that they're using to um, make these things that they, in fact, to this day, there's only, uh, only Ford remanufacturers that can actually build these injectors. Nobody, the, the fuel shops around the country can't rebuild them. Only Ford can because Ford has proprietary products that they line these injectors with to make them work good. But how this thing works is we have a coil on this side and a coil on this side. And we're just simply going to move this spool valve back and forth about, about 15 thousandths of an inch, not very much at all. And when we move that, it's going to allow the, the oil. Remember, remember the Huey A and B had oil coming in on the side. Well, we're going to bring this oil in from the top. We're going to use a log on top. And I got some pictures of that here in a second. But the oil is going to come in on the top. We're just going to move this 
spool valve back or back and forth. And, uh, but beyond that, other than the size, the fact that it's a little smaller, it does exactly the same thing as the Huey A and B. We're going to work against this intensifier piston, inject the fuel, offseat the poppet valve off its, off its seat, and inject the fuel. It's going to, so it, it's all technically going to work the same. Um, it's just a picture of, of the current involved to turn it on and turn it off and, and hold it and do everything that you need to do. That's not that relevant to us. Um, here's just a kind of a breakdown of that of that uh, um, injector. Here's the body of the bore and here's the intensifier piston that sits inside of here or the plunger that sits inside here. And this is the in, uh, intensifier piston. And again, here you can see that they call it an amplifier piston here, depending on who's talking, it's either gonna be an amplifier piston or an intensifier piston. Um, but it's just gonna sit in, in here. And here's, a, here's the spool valve that sits, just goes back and forth in here. And it's just, and it's, drawn back and forth by magnetism. They're gonna, they're gonna turn one um, coil into a magnet. It's gonna pull it one direction, they'll turn it the other way. It's gonna turn a magnet the other direction. So um, pretty simple design. Um, same thing, uh, the pressurized oil gives us the force needed to physically make it work. Um, but the digital design with the spool valve and the two solenoids, um, that's what they're calling it, digital. It, it, that technology made it so they can turn this thing on and off much faster than they were able to do with the Huey A and Bs. So they can actually, you know, they can actually do post injection events and, and they can give multiple firing events. And I do know, I do know that uh, Ford originally had some, when this first came out early on, they were doing multiple in events, trying to do pilot injection, trying to do you know several injection events, and to quiet the engines down. And uh, I know that they had problems with them firing that fast, and so they programmed those out of it. We reprogrammed and got rid of some of that stuff. And a lot of customers complained because the engines weren't as quiet as they once were, but they didn't work as good either with with the pilot injection. So they kind of some trade-offs in there. But here's a really good close-up of the two coils. You just have a coil here and a coil here. And whichever one you're going to energize is going to pull this spool valve over. And there's just because of the way of, of, um, of magnetics and, and stuff, there's residual magnetism that sits in these that helps these things uh, move super fast. And I don't understand the whole ins and outs of it because if there was residual magnetism here and over here and you're trying to pull it this way, you would think that would kind of keep it that way, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. It, it moves back and forth here uh, super fast because it's only, remember, we're only moving this thing about 15 thousandths of an inch. It's not very much at all. It's just super, super small. This doesn't have to be very big. Um, um, one of the problems we have on these injectors, uh, it, occasionally is this nut will back off here and this bolt will fall out and the, and the, uh, the, the spools may stay on there a little bit and they'll cause them to run and not run. And, you know, it can be a bit of a problem, but um, that's how it works. Um, this is all this redundant stuff. Um, obviously can't interchange with old injectors. Okay. When we say cannot be interchanged with older injectors, that is, you know, if you're thinking Gen 2 to uh, Huey A and Bs, well, that's obvious because they're twice as big or half as big or whatever. But if we were talking, if they're talking about a, there is that in 2003, when we introduced the Huey uh, Gen 2 uh, in the six liter, uh, the 03s and the early 04s all the way up into a nine production date of 929 of 2003. Um, those injectors were of one type and then, then the 2004 all the way to 2010 were different and they are not interchangeable. They, they won't, they don't work the same. <clears throat> they, they, they'll fight each other. They don't because of the materials they're made out of. So there were two different injectors and you can't interchange them. So this is just a generic picture of how a Gen 2 system would work. 
Um, you'll have high pressure oil uh, supplied to a log of some sort. And I think I've got some better pictures of the logs, but these are uh, just a fuel rail that's gonna sit on top and the oil is going to um, go in the top of each of these injectors. And then your side of the injector, your fuel is still gonna be delivered through ports in the cylinder head itself. And there's a really good picture of a log on a 2000, uh, mid-year 2004 and later. It's a the big giant log. The earlier production ones used to use a, uh, a small round tube, but they're designed to um, have a, a kind of a reserve of oil up there in pressure. These uh, branch tubes here do um, bring oil up from a uh, kind of a, a um, distribution system that sits inside the block. Okay, this acoustic wave attenuation fittings uh, help minimize rhythmic clacking or cackling kind of noise that's in the system, okay? And these uh, fittings are on this one here are bolted in the side here. I've never taken one apart, I've never seen it. So I don't know what they look like, but I do know that they're there. Um, the branch tube here, this, this they're calling this a branch tube, but this is actually a standpipe, the, the branch tube, Go, it goes actually into a branch tube that goes to the other uh, cylinders. But this, this um, standpipe actually has a check valve system inside of it that keeps the engine, keeps the oil from pulsating through the system and, and, and settle this thing down. Because as that oil is coming through and you got all these injectors trying to fire and do it, you, you really, you got super big uh, pressure waves inside that system. And if, if you didn't have these check valves and this acoustic attenuation fitting, um, you end up with this pulsations in there and it, and it starts messing with all the other injectors. And these are just designed to help stabilize it all. Um, I've had a couple of these go bad and really very, very difficult to, to diagnose, but uh, pretty rare. And, I'm, and if I had one of these go bad, I didn't know it. I wouldn't, I don't know. I don't know if there's a diagnostic process to check it or not. So, um, so again, we're going to have a fill, um, we're going to have a fill uh, cycle. We're going to have a main injection. We're going to have an end just like the others. Um, the fill is going to prevent the oil from coming in. The low pressure uh, enters the injector and fills everything up. The, uh, is this a uh, fill cycle? Yeah, so the injector's off. Uh, this is all at atmospheric pressure. Fuel inlets come in here and it's just filling this chamber up with fuel. Um, everything's just kind of there at rest. Then you have the main injection event, which we're gonna move the spool valve. We're gonna put oil pressure in on here and that's gonna start injecting fuel and then as it moves further, it's gonna inject, uh, make more and more pressure. So you can see in here, the pressure is starting to build less than uh, 20, uh, less than 3,100 PSI. And then at 3,100 PSI, this thing starts to inject fuel. And then end of injection, we're gonna turn that thing off uh, in a split second. Spool valve is gonna move over and close. We're gonna uh, lock off the oil entering it. We're gonna vent the rest of it. And, and we're gonna stop injection and the whole thing's gonna start over again. Um, you can see that it just looks like the same as the inlet. It's just gonna start filling. As soon as you turn it off, pressure is gonna stop. This is gonna return. You're gonna start filling it back up again. Okay, so we have the ability to, um, again, just like the, the, the Huey A and Bs, plunger travel is gonna determine uh, how much um, fuel is going to go into the cylinder. And that's going to be controlled by how long we're going to leave those coils on and allow how, lo, allowing oil pressure in. Just like on the other ones, how long it's on, the pressure coming in, we're going to adjust how much uh, volume of fuel is going to go into that cylinder. Because remember, on, a, on that cylinder, we've got ultimate air. If we put just a little bit of fuel in, we're only going to make a little bit of torque. We put a lot of fuel in, we're going to make a lot of torque. So we can, and, and that's going to translate into speed, how fast that crankshaft's turning if there's no resistance to it. So at idle, when there's nothing that crankshaft, if you're in park and you have nothing rest restricting that crankshaft, 
if we put more and more fuel in there, it's just going to keep raising speed and raising speed and raising speed. So um, all that metering is going to be done by how long we leave the um, oil pressure going on that intensifier piston and the uh, rate of, of, of how much that's going in is going to be based on the pressure that that um, high pressure oil is pushing against that intensifier piston. Um, we just talked about that. Okay, so all of that, whether it's in the A and B or the Gen 2, is all going to be controlled by the computer and all the different inputs, crankshaft uh, sensors, camshaft sensor. In the, um, in the 7.3, we only have a camshaft sensor. Map pressure, which is manifold pressure. Your accelerator pedal is all, there's no, there's no accelerator cable. It's all a, a sensor on a pedal. Engine oil temperature, um, uh, barometric pressure, exhaust pressure, uh, intake air temperature, mass airflow, air, um, idle air temperature coming in the engine, EGR position, engine coolant temperature, engine uh, injection control pressure. All those inputs are going to come in to this, to the um, PCM here. And it's going to make decisions about what it wants to do. And it's going to tell a um, different module. Now, on the 7.3s, it was called a IDM, which is an injector driver module. In the 6 liter, it's called a fuel injection control module, or we call it a FICM. But the injector driver module or the FICM, whichever you engine it is, it is it that is responsible for making all of the... Um, decisions about what's happening with these injectors. The PCM just tells it what it wants to do. This module here makes all the decisions about how long it's going to keep them on, how long it's going to, uh, or, or, you know, when it's going to turn them off, what, what time it's going to turn them on and all of that. Okay. All that's going to happen based on this. Okay. So then you have the high pressure or the low pressure fuel system supplying oil or fuel to the injectors. We have the lubrication system that's going to bring the high pressure oil to that. And then all of this high pressure oil that's left over is just going to get dumped right back into the crankcase. So here is the uh, Gen 2. And why isn't it playing? It should be playing. There it goes. Okay. So you can see that the spool valve just opens up. And that's gonna be just a little bit of um, pressure there, just a small, you know, it's it's a low. Then we're gonna turn it on a little higher. And now look at, look at the length that that plunger is pushing now. So we can change the length of on time of those coils to change the injection rate in the engine, okay? So, and we'll, we'll, I think we're going to touch on it briefly later, but I'm going to tell you, talk about it right now. One of the problems that these injectors have, one of the problems that these systems have is um, a phenomenon called stiction, stiction or stickage, depending on who you're talking to. But what happens is whether it's, whether it's here or in the little poppet valve on a gen or on a, a Huey A or B, it really doesn't matter. But this is highly dependent upon the oil's ability to come through here. Okay. One of the downfalls of this engine are, or these injector types are, is is oil. If people don't change their oil as oil ages, as oil's cold, you name it. There's a million things that cause it, but what happens 
is this um, porting in here. Remember this thing only, this on this injector, it only moves 15 thousandths of an inch. <clears throat> so it's not very much. If you get uh, gooey, yucky oil starts to build up inside here and it crud starts to plug this thing up, it doesn't matter how far you turn it on. If that oil can't get through here, it's going to affect how this thing runs, right? Same with the other ones as they open up at that pop valve, there's crud in there. And so what typically happens is that these injectors, when they're cold, because the oil's cold and thick, these don't operate very well. And so you end up with misfires. The car doesn't run real good. You, a whole variety of problems because of what they call stiction or stickage. And that's the oil that's coming in here is gummed up. As the engine warms up and the oil gets thinner, it, it starts working and everything's kind of happy. Sometimes, sometimes they won't. Seven threes are real famous that they will just flat stop working. Uh, you can't, you know, you can't even get them. To, they, if you got enough injectors that aren't working, they just won't run cold at all. You can't get them to start. You can plug the block heaters in, get the engine hot and it may start. Um, but on the, on the Huey A and B, there was zero fix for them. Everybody, every chemical company in the world tried to come up with a, uh, some kind of additive that they were going to put in the oil that was going to clean all that out and make it work. Never happened. There's not a snake oil out there that works. The only thing you can do is replace the injector. On these injectors, however, we had problems with it and they came up with an idea that they would, that these coils, they would, when they turn them on and off, they were only on for what they say back there, eight hundredths of a millisecond. I mean, like super quick, they turn them off, turn off and, you know, just moving them back and forth. Well, they figured out that if when they pulled this thing over, if they left that coil on a little bit longer, um, it caused heat to build up inside here and it quickly heated these things up and got past that problem. And it fixes probably 98% of all the problems you have with these injectors. Um, so it's a really good thing that helped make this work doesn't fix them all and there's times we still have to change injectors but again there's no chemical out there that we, we can put in there one thing that does work if you take uh when you're changing the oil if you if you uh kept four quarts of oil out and put four quarts of diesel fuel in the oil and made the oil really thin it makes these work really good however you can't run all that oil a fuel in your oil because it, you lose the lubricating value of your oil so it doesn't so it doesn't work and so then as soon as you put regular oil back in it you still have the same problem now every good thing always every good deed always goes unpunished so when they started doing the uh post what they call it there's a term they called it to heat these up when they did that, by leaving those things on, well, that caused the driver modules that, that were running these to overheat the, the uh, drivers. And so then all of a sudden we started having problems with the driver modules. So they fixed one problem, caused another problem, um, but they were able to kind of get around that and fix it. And I'll show you the, I'll show you the little pieces that you know here in a minute, but um, does that make sense? Everybody, all that stickage thing, stiction? I mean, it's, it is a real thing. And it is a, you get, if you start working on, on diesels or start working on these, that is you, one of the things that you will notice is, Hey, these things run terrible cold. And then all of a sudden they run good. Um, and that and we can identify which cylinders are causing the problem because we can see which cylinders are misfiring and we can just pray, start changing injectors out. So, okay. So let's kind of shift gears away from the injectors. Does everybody think they got a handle on how those injectors work? Is that all pretty good? Anybody need to go back and beat up more of that? Okay, then um, let's start talking about the um, high pressure systems. So this is a very critical part of making this thing work. So we have the low pressure oil supply. This, we have the uh, oil reservoirs. We have the high pressure pump. And then we have the uh, injection control regulations. We call that the IPR, injection, compression, injection control pressure regulator, IPR. 
Um, so oil is supplied um, to the high pressure oil system um, from a low pressure system. So, you know, we just have our regular um, oil pressure system and it's just gonna have an extra port that's gonna come out and supply the high pressure oil system. So there's two, um, there are two different kinds of systems that are out there. And the early 7.3s had what they called a short circuit oil supply system. And what it did was when the, it made sure that the high pressure oil system didn't starve for oil. And so it ran oil, unfiltered oil straight up past a little check ball and into the reservoir for the high pressure oil system. And this just caused it to fill up with oil quickly, uh, made everything work really good. And, but its downfall was we had unfiltered uh, oil going into the high pressure system. So now you had crud going through the system and, and that's never a good thing. They used in the early ones, they had a little edge filter on there. They try to keep the crud out um, and uh, didn't have a ton of problems with it, but uh, this little one-way check ball that would go in there, occasionally those would stick. And if those stick and the guy's sitting on a hill, you know, it would, it would drain the oil out and just be a problem. So this is a picture that they show of this, this um, short circuit oil supply. However, this is not really a short circuit because when we talk about short circuit, we're bypassing the oil filter. And this thing, this picture does not. It comes from the oil pump, goes through the filter, comes up and comes in here. But what the short circuit did was it had a second circuit that would go past here, go straight up from the dirty oil here, because it's coming straight out of the pump sump, and it would go up into a bore in the block through a check valve that sits on the bottom of the block right here, and then run into the reservoir. It'd have to, have to unseat that check ball, but so once the filtered, you know, once the oil was filtered, oil could get up in here, it overcame that, and it worked, um, and you got filtered oil in there. But first thing in the morning, just to make sure that it had plenty of oil, it would go, it would bypass all that and just go straight up in there. Um, so whatever on this picture, but this is a pretty decent picture of, of a high pressure pump with on a 7.3, you would have uh, just these flexible lines. These are external, this sits outside the engine and it would, uh, these lines sat outside the engine and this, these, rails in here would actually be in the cylinder head and these would just bolt to the cylinder head. We had problems with, you know, any of these, any of these fittings could leak and these lines would blow out, the pump would leak, any of that kind of stuff that would cause us any kind of problems. Okay. Then there's a filtered oil supply system. And this is where we're um, just a straight up oil supply that's going to come through a pump, through a cooler, through the filter, and then it's going to go um, straight into a reservoir always filtered, never unfiltered. And then it go to the high pressure pump. The pump's going to build pressure. Um, that pressure is either going to be regulated, is it, I'm not either going to be, it's going to be regulated by the IPR, the in injection pressure regulator. And that regulator is just going to dump oil back to the crankcase. If that's how it's, it's either going to, if it's fully closed off, it's going to have ultimate pressure or if it's open, it's going to dump all the pressure off. So and they're going to pulse width modulate this and regulate how much oil is how much oil pressure is going to the oil rails? Um, so all these things have uh, bypass check valves on them. So the pump, if the pump has, makes too much pressure, it's going to just dump oil back to the sump. The oil cooler, if the oil cooler becomes restricted, there's a um, spring ball check ball that can get past it. The oil filter, if the oil filter becomes restricted, it can uh, bypass the oil filter you know, so this thing won't starve for oil, but by design, it's supposed to be all filtered oil coming to the system. Um, so the high pressure system is designed to deliver that engine oil under high pressure uh, to pressurize, you know, to work against that intensifier piston. Um, the high pressure oil pump uh, is connected to a reservoir that, uh, to a low pressure reservoir um, that, so that it always has a, a supply of oil to it. Um, these are all, all these are gear driven off the 
camshafts at some point, some in the front, some in the back, depends on the engine and their fixed displacement. They don't, you know, they don't vary it at all. It's just a piston or a swash plate. There's one type that's a piston pump. And then there's other ones is this kind of a swash plate thing that runs about six or eight pistons. And uh, they're all pretty reliable. We don't have a ton of problems with them. Uh, there's lines and tubes that connect it all together. So oil is going to get to the injectors a couple different ways. We have the oil galleys, remember that the Huey A and Bs, they, they were oil galleys in the head that they went through. Um, but the, um, the Gen 2s have a rail up on top. They have that manifold that sits up on top. Uh, we have lots of problems with any of these joints, whether there's O-rings, fittings, all those fittings and everything, all those can create a leak. Because remember, we're dealing with anywhere from 500 to, you know, 3,000, 4,000 PSI of pressure. Um, it, it really works. And, it, and it's not like it's constant pressure. It's on and off, on and off. So these fittings and these uh, O-rings get worked and worked and worked. So um, we have plenty of problems with high pressure oil. In fact, high pressure oil is usually our biggest problem on these. Um, the regulator, it's there to help regulate the amount of oil pressure we're going to use. It's electronically operated spool valve um, that's, you know, just pulse width modulated. So it's just going to vary how much oil pressure is going inside this high pressure system. It's, it's going to, <clears throat> excuse me, it is going to be, um, I think I have a picture of it here. Yeah, I'll talk about it in a second. So, so the computer is going to take all this information in and it's going to make a decision how much oil pressure it wants to have. And so you, this is this, if you were to watch this on an oscilloscope, watch the electrical current coming out, it's, it's going to be pulse width modulated. Okay. The higher, the higher the duty cycle, the higher pressure is going to be. In other words, we're going to turn that valve more and more off. It's normally open valve so that it, if it's unplugged, it's just going to dump all the pressure into the oil pan. And if it's 100% on, it's going to give us a completely sealed system. So it's going to work somewhere between a fully open to a fully closed um, valve. It's just going to dump that oil back off so we can adjust uh, pressure according to what the computer wants to see. Okay. And here's a picture of that. Okay. The oil is going to come from the pump and go to the injectors. And it's just, we're just creating a leak. If it's, if it's closed all the way off, all the pressure is going to go out. If it's, if we pull it open, all that's going to go back into the sump. And it's just going to be a matter of how much we open or close this valve. And here's a, there's two different styles that we're going to use. This is, this is off of a seven, three. And this, this here is what we call an edge filter in here is when this goes into that, into the um, pump, the oil is coming in here has to go around this little edge right here and big chunks can't get in there. So they, it's called an edge filter. And all this thing is, is just a magnet here that just opens and closes, pulls, it just pulls that um, plunger in there against the spring inside and that just dumps it back to the sump. So the system, it'd be what we call a closed loop system. The computer is going to make a decision and make the going to make a, a pulse width modulated decision on the IPR. The IPR is going to move. It's going to make a, you know, the pressure is going to change the ICP, which is injection control pressure. It's going to measure that pressure and it's going to say, nope, it's not right. It's going to make a decision to change it a little bit. So it's just constant circle of make a decision, read it, make a decision, read it. You know, so it's constantly changing what it's, what, um, you know, monitoring and changing what's happening. It's called a closed loop system. Um, yeah, it's just the same thing. And same thing, just the, this, the IPR is output duty cycle. And then you're going to see that the ICP sensor is an analog signal. And it's just going to, you're just going to see the oil pressure change. And, you know, if you're watching it on a graph. Okay. So the oil pressure needs to stay relatively stable. And there's some things that we're going to look at here in a minute. That's going to get, can affect how stable that oil is because, um, 
if the oil pressure isn't stable, then the injectors can't operate the way they need to operate. So the computer's relying on good stable oil pressure in order for those injectors to operate. And um, so the PCM is going to receive a bunch of signals from everything. It's making, it's generating outputs based on what it knows to make all that stuff happen. And, and so if when we start trying to diagnose these things, if, if, if oil pressure, because oil pressure is a variable in this thing, remember that, that oil pressure, we can have dirty oil, we can have aerated oil, we can have all kinds of things, you know, the wrong oil and all those variables all start messing with stuff. And that really affects how this thing's going to operate. Um, we talked about that already. Uh, we talked about that already. So when I talked about those driver modules that were uh, keeping those injectors on so that they could heat up and get rid of that stiction. That's this right in here. This is a, this is where all that uh, transformers take place. We're going to bring 12 volts and we're going to jump it up to 48 volts. And that's going to happen through these transformers in here and, uh, and these uh, capacitors and these things get burned up because they are overloaded. So for a while, we were actually changing just half of this module to, uh, re to repair those, but most of those valves have been fixed, so there's not a whole lot of them still out there. But this is this is the actual inside of one of those FICOMs. Uh, we just talked about that. Okay, so maintenance and problems with these things. We talked about stiction. Um, <clears throat> And remember, they cannot be cleaned using aftermarket snake oil. So if you have a problem with them, you got to change the injectors. And if, they said if software updates don't fix it, you got to change them. And remember the Huey A and B, don't, there was no software correction. So, And if you're going to change the injectors, follow the, the manufacturer's recommendations how to do it. There's, there's some procedures that need to take place to do that. Um, So leakage, leakage in the high pressure oil system is a major problem that we have. It's going to cause um, problems. You can have, like it says here, differences between hot and cold starting times. Sometimes leaks cause engines to hard start cold. Sometimes, most of the time, they'll cause them to either not start at all hot or start really hard. You can have loss of power. Uh, uh, we can have fuel consumption, oil consumption, smoke, all kinds of stuff all kinds of issues. Um, but the going back to the hard start or no start hot, think about if you have a leak and when the oil's cold, it's thicker, more viscous. So if we have a leak, the oil can overcome that leak because it's thick. But as the engine gets hot and the oil becomes thin and you turn it off and you go back out to restart it, now this oil can't overcome that leak path. And so you can't build the pressure that you need to start this engine. Engine cools down a little while, Oil gets a little thicker, boom, starts right back up again. Very typical complaint on a, a six liter or a 7.3. Um, more so with a six liter. And uh, we'll cover some of those leak points here in a second. Um, but understanding how the high pressure oil system works um, is, is essential uh, for helping you be able to diagnose these things, okay? The correct viscosity and grade of oil are of the greatest importance. If we don't have the right oil in the car, you'll have all kinds of problems that either going to wear the engine out or you're just, or they're, or it's going to cause it to run rough, misfire, maybe not start hot, all that kind of stuff. Um, these engines are really critical to uh, uh, dirty air filters, loose or missing oil caps. Cause when we have oil caps missing, they, does the crankcase gets sucks in dirt, dirt gets in there and if the dirt, you know, doesn't get all the way filtered out, all that stuff gets into the injectors. It just messes with everything. So um, it's super important to have good, clean oil in these systems. Um, so let's look at testing these uh, high pressure systems. So, so when we, I got some pictures in here in a second here. The high pressure oil systems, you, we can we can diagnose them a couple of different ways depending on what's going on with them. 
if we have one that we suspect that we have a leak and it's not that's not showing up in a in a hard start or something like that, which can happen because remember that when we're starting this thing, it we're not we don't we're not talking real high oil pressure, maybe 500 pounds, but these things driving down the road can make up to uh, 3,000 pounds of pressure. So if you have a leak that's leaking at you know say 2,500 psi and above, how in the world are you going to find that? Okay, well we can do that based on we can watch some of the numbers that we're seeing with how that IPR is working. The, um, and the computer itself is usually going to tell you, Hey, I'm having to work extra hard at, you know, these RPMs. And so you've obviously got a leak someplace. So there's some things that we can do to try to find these leaks. So here are some, um, we've already seen this pretty much exactly the same picture of the high pressure oil system in a, in a, whether it's, a, this says it's a six liter, which is essentially the same for a seven three. So this is what it's gonna lay out inside of a uh, six liter. You have a high pressure pump sitting here. And remember we have this branch tube that comes out and we have these standpipes. Remember in those other pictures, we had those standpipes that go up and these are the fuel logs or the oil logs that sit up in here. And then they go down into the injectors. These are your gen two injectors, okay? That's the extent of a high pressure oil system in this car. Super simple, but as this is driven off the camshaft on the back of the engine, this builds the pressure that we want. And there's an IPR that sits in, actually sits in the housing up here and leaks off. Um, but all this is under high pressure oil. If we have a leak anywhere in this system, we can have a problem. So, uh, so how is that pressure controlled? It's controlled by the IPR. How, remember, if we have an IPR sitting in here, we build high pressure oil, anything we can, we can regulate that oil by dumping that pressure back into the crankcase. And it's just going to, we're going to, we're going to regulate the high pressure oil based on the IPR. The computer's gonna control it, no big deal. So the IPR, we can actually watch that percentage. So this is a normal system. You can see we started cranking the car, went from zero RPM, we started cranking it, it starts, engine sitting here idling. We rev the engine up, okay? So we started it, we would expect to see, you know, engine idle about 24% the IPR is on, okay? As we rev it up, went up to 61%, we would expect to see this, our pressures, this is our, our uh, ICP pressure, this is the pressure that's going on inside the high pressure system. And then as we rev the engine up, we're sitting at about 2,400 PSI. It's exactly what we'd wanna see. Um, typical high pressure system, you got your high pressure pump, goes to the left head to the right head we have a sensor in here measuring the the pressure in that in the in the system because the syst even though the sensor is on the right head the system is all equally under the same pressure remember our our uh, principles of hydraulic are that pressure is the same in a in in all points of a system so we can know that that pressure is there the IPR sit here, if it's all the way on, it's just gonna dump oil or we can turn it off and it's gonna regulate that oil back and forth. So here we have a system with a high IPR. So remember the picture before when it was running at idle, we were at 24% and here we're at what, 27%. But look at here at the same RPM, we're at 80% to get the same PSI. So we can conclude from that, that we're having to work harder to get the same pressure. So we've either got a pump that's not working well, or we have a leak in the system, okay? So here's a really great picture of a leak in the system. It looks like a spider got in there really. <laughs> but if you have a leak in the system, now, everything has to work a little harder to overcome that leak. So we can, we can see it 
in the percentage of the IPR, how that IPR is working harder to do the same thing to overcome a leak. And all that means is we're having to put more work on this IPR. We're going to have to close it further to keep the same pressure. Okay. That's one way of, of you can't identify what the leak is, but we can tell that something's not right. Okay. Honestly, most of our leaks are going to show up in no start or hard start conditions. And so, um, but we can, we can be, like I said, we can be alerted to some of these faults um, based on uh, codes. The computer, if, if the computer saw this, if the computer saw this when you're driving down the road, or even at idle, if you know, we were sitting there revving it up and it saw that it had to do 80% to do this, it's going to pop a code. It's going to tell us, it's going to give us like a 2284, a 2290, 20, you know, something like that. It's going to give us a code that's going to say, hey, I have to work harder than I should have to for a given period of time. So, um, it's going to, it's going to give us codes for, you know, working harder. It doesn't, it's not working at idle. I have to work too hard to get, I, um, oil pressure built up at idle. I mean, during cranking, any of those kinds of things, it's going to give us some codes. So we're going to, the computer's not generally going to leave us out there on our own. Um, but uh, leaks or worn pumps and stuff like that, you know, they can be a bit of a challenge because it's like, well, do I have a bad pump or do I have a leak? Um, so usually, usually the leaks are going to manifest themselves as hard starting engines. But if you had a a pump that's worn out, it may start and work good, but it doesn't work when you're driving down the road, you know, when it's, when you're trying to get the pressures. So you kind of learn that stuff as you go along. Um, so how do we find, how do we find leaks in the high pressure system? Well, it's really simple. Um, most leaks are going to manifest themselves at much lower pressures just because they are. So we can intrusively go into um, the high pressure oil system and take some different plugs out or the, uh, the sensor out. And we can actually put a, a fitting in there and put shop air in. Okay. By putting shop air into the system and listening, we can identify, Hey, I have a leak. You know, I have air leaking under this valve cover or that valve cover in the back of the engine. And there's different locations that we can go to and find where the heck these leaks are coming from. It's actually quite, um, it's, it's actually quite easy and probably 99% of the time, uh, it's very straightforward to, to find a leak. Uh, but there are times when, when it's like, man, I, I don't, I've got a problem, but I cannot find a leak. And it, you may have a problem. There may be a problem with your, uh, the pump itself is not working when it's hot or something like that. So, um, most of the time it's all going to be, it's all going to be very physical. We're going to air check it. We're going to put air on it and then we can, we can start listening, but there's times when uh, like on a seven, three, we not, we may not be able to, to air test it. And we're trying to figure out why, why don't, why can't I make pressure? We can actually cap off half the engine or, and, and, and run it on half the engine to see if we can make pressure on one half the engine or the other half and just try to identify where in the world these leaks are coming from. And it would be really fun if we were in the shop showing you some of these leaks right now, but we're not, we don't have that ability. Maybe in the spring, you can take this class again. Oh, joy. Uh, uh, we talked about that. Okay, so here's an interesting statement. Um, plugged oil filter screens on the IPR a limit oil supply to injectors. Okay. So on the six liter and the 4.5, they have a IPR has a screen on the end of it to keep crud. If, if crud was to get past the oil filter, past the filter, there's a little filter inside the reservoir and then all the way past the high pressure pump and it started to get through the IPR and then into the injectors. Theoretically, this little filter is supposed to plug that up, you know, to stop that from happening. Well, the reality of life is, is if 
any crud gets past all those things and gets to that filter, the oil volume of oil trying to travel from that high pressure pump at that pressures coming through there. If there's any, if there's enough debris on the end of that screen to, you know, kind of plug up that, that, uh, screen on that regulator, it blows a hole right through that screen and just fills the regulator full of crud and the car stops. So, um, yeah, if you, if you pull an IPR off and it's full of crud, you just got to replace it. Okay, so another problem that we have with the high pressure systems is oil aeration. Okay, if, if air gets in the oil, it's a problem. So how's air going to get in the oil? Well, the oil, remember we talk about engine oil in the, in the um, 193A class. Some of, the, some of the properties of engine oil is that they put antifoaming agents in them. And oil specifically designed for Huey injection engines are have really high antifoaming agents so that we don't foam the oil, so that we don't uh, have a problem with air and trained oil. So um, remember from our hydraulic lessons, air compresses fluids, oil does not. If we have oil, air in the oil, it can't compress. So what happens is we get this really spongy, um, spongy injection thing happening and it, and it causes the engine to run rough. And what ultimately happens, remember if we look back at that slide back here, where this IPR was really high, well, there's a, you know, just by looking at this number, we can't, I can't tell you that it has a leak or not, but what's happening back here, if we have air in the oil, if we have air in the oil, that number is going to come up as well because it's trying to work harder to get the fuel in there that it can't get in there because it's working against a spongy hydraulic system. So it's important that we have the right oil in there that that doesn't happen. So what are some other ways that oil can become aerated? Well, you won't see it. I've never seen it on a 7.3, but on a six liter, we can have um, problems with the fuel injector itself. Let me go back to one of those pictures of a six liter injector back here. Fuel will leak out the body pass this O-ring and leak into the crankcase, okay? And when that happens, over time, and it takes, it takes a while, but it depends on how much um, oil is, or fuel is leaking out of it, but it will start to fill the crankcase up, okay? And so now all of a sudden you've got, you can have, you know, you could, you could put five more, five or more quarts of, fuel in the oil. So now all of a sudden you got a really high oil level in the crankcase and you didn't even know it was happening. But all of a sudden the crankshaft's spinning around down there and it's whooping up that oil, right? And it's whooping it, whooping it, whooping it. And now it's turning it all to foam. And what happens is usually driving around, it's not a big deal. But the guy, you know, a, a really good place where it always happens is if, does everybody know where Crest is in, in El Cajon? Where the, the hill going up to Crest? Super, super long, high load hill. You go cranking up that engine, you know, going up that hill with all that foam going on in there. You get to the top of the, the hill up there and most of the time the engine will just stall because it can't, it gets so much foam and so much stuff going on. It just stalls. You're like, what the heck's going on? You turn it off, you know, the engine stops, everything settles down, starts right back up again. But that is a real, um, it's a, it's a way bigger problem than having aerated oil from, you know, the wrong oil or something like that. So uh, it's always incumbent upon you. Anytime you're working on anything, the first thing you do is do a visual inspection on a vehicle. And the first part of a good visual inspection would be to open the hood and check the oil level. Do I have oil? Or do I not? It's really common, really common on a 7.3 engine to have a um, engine stall on you. 
Now, a um, remember, we have to have engine oil to make this engine work. If you don't have engine oil, we can't inject the fuel. So what happens really, really common on a 7.3 is that people don't change their oil. And a 7.3 will use about a quart of oil, you know, maybe a th every thousand miles or something, which is no big deal. Cause if you're going to change your oil every 5,000 miles, you got 15 quarts in there. You can have that thing will go down to 10 quarts and nobody will be the wiser of it. But these people will go, you know, they could go, I, I've seen them go 15, 20,000 miles without changing their oil. Well, what's happening is they're that oil it's using oil, using oil. And all of a sudden they've only got maybe three quarts of oil left in the bottom of this engine. So what happens and this is a very common complaint. <clears throat> Start their truck. They take off. They make it about a block. The engine stalls. They're like, what the heck's going on? They sit there for a minute. They start cranking it. Starts back up. Runs great the next day. All the rest of the day. By golly, the next day it does the same thing to them. Well, what's happened is they, they start it. The oil's in there. They start it. All, the, all that cold, thick oil gets pumped up to the top of the engine. There's nothing left in the bottom because it's all stuck up on top now. It sucks a bunch of air. It stalls. Well, by the time they pull over and everything, the oil gets back to the bottom. It's warmed up a little bit now. And now it starts flowing. And now they're, they're good for the rest of the day. And, it's gonna, and they'll do that. And they'll be like, you know, every day this week, it keeps doing the same thing. And, you know, they bring it in and you go in there, you pull the dipstick out. There's nothing on the dipstick. There's no oil. And you find out, well, the last time they changed their oil was, you know, when their kid was in grade school and now he's graduating high school. So um, very, very common because the, because the 7.3 uses oil. The 6 liter doesn't use any oil at all. That You could go, you typically you could go, you know, 30, 50,000 miles and never have used a quart of oil in a six liter, just the way it is designed. So that never happens on a six liter. Um, and we'll talk about the six, four next week in its fuel system because it makes oil. And so if you went 20,000 miles on a, on a six, four, you would actually have too much oil in the crankcase. We'll talk about that and why that does that, uh, next week. So, so let's, uh, Let's, let's blow through these summaries real quick just to make sure everybody's on the, on the same page of everything uh, where we're at. Um, the Huey was, was one of the first steps in the evolution of, of getting diesel injection from old style into electronically controlled stuff. Um, the primary disadvantage of the old traditional stuff was they couldn't pressurize the fuel that they needed to do um, to overcome the high pressures at lower our engine RPMs. Um, Huey and systems were developed to ensure peak injection pressures independent of engine speed, meaning that max, a maximum spray in pressure is available whether the engine's operating at idle or maximum RPM. During uh, hard acceleration or sudden load changes at low speeds, the system can instantly adjust fuel pressurization to best match combustion pressures and conditions to minimize emissions. Okay, <clears throat> everything everything's driven by minimizing emissions. Uh, instead of using cam lobes and springs and flyweights and levers and to operate a Huey system, it's all done by software code, microprocessors, electrical signals, and all of that, achieving more precise control of the injection events than previous systems. Huey systems replace the mechanical uh, camshaft with highly pressurized lubrication oil and that is the key we're using high pressure oil instead of a mechanical camshaft this oil actuates a plunger that pressurizes fuel for injection oil pressure is multiplied inside the injector by using an intensifier piston because the functions of pressur pressurization metering timing and atomization are all incorporated into a single injector body the huey is considered a unit injector uh, injection pressures are regulated by varying oil pressure supplied to the injector. This regulation of oil pressures enables the in control of the injection pressure to match the engine operational requirements. Huey injector, I'm sorry, Huey systems 
uh, components are, are interchangeable with large, a large variety of engine sizes and whatnot. Ongoing development of the Huey technology has improved the ability to shape the rate of fuel injection, <clears throat> thus reducing combustion noise and emissions for quieter, cleaner engine operation. Which is, which is interesting that they say it like that because we stopped using them because we needed something better. Uh, Huey injectors are highly pressurized, use highly pressurized engine oil to provide injection force. Uh, I think that's pretty redundant. There are four basic variations of the injectors. We only talked about three. Um, the A and the B, uh, the A and B split shot injectors have four components that operate together for precise metering, timing, and rate control. The components are the high voltage solenoid, the poppet valve, the intensifier piston, and the plunger, and then the nozzle assembly. The um, yeah, the three stages of injection are the fill, the injection, and then the end. Uh, that's what, that's true of all three injectors. And uh, injection timing events are adjustments are made by changing the points at which the injector solenoid begins energizing and stops stop energizing. Yeah, that's all redundant. Um, that's redundant. This is important. This the second generation of the Gen 2 injector uses digital control valve technology. The valve, this valve technology replaces the poppet valve by using the two spool valves, remember? Um, this is just the same as the other ones. Same. Okay, all of them. The plunger travel determines the injection quantity. So the longer we leave the injector on, the longer that, that plunger travels, the more fuel is going to go in the cylinder. I mean, it really kind of kind of common sense there. But uh, um, the more fuel we put in there, the more torque we're going to make out of that cylinder. Just talked about that. We talked about that. Oil pressure is regulated by using the PCM controlled pulse width modulated IPR. Uh, this injection pre uh, control pressure device is an electromagnetically controlled spool valve that moves in response to the strength of a magnet. Okay. The oil pressure for the injection actu actualization, ac that, that word is adjusted as the PCM changes current flow to the coil. So we're going to make a bigger magnet or less magnet. We're going to move that spool valve back and forth. Um, the engines are controlled by the PCM through a whole bunch of algorithms and stored data and software instructions. Uh, but they do have uh, adaptive strategies involved with them so that they can kind of adapt and learn how, how those things run. And we'll really get into some real minute stuff when we get into the common rail next week. Redundant here. Talked about that a second ago. Talked about that. We talked about air in the fuel system. And unless otherwise indicated, all photographs and illustrations are under copyright from Jones and Barrett. All right. So I guess uh, Arturo gave up on us. <laughs> so you guys understand how a Huey system works. So pretty, pretty cool system. Um, not much more to say about it other than uh, if you want to, I, I, I did post, um, I posted the video and the, and the uh, um, PowerPoint from last, uh, from Tuesday's thing on there. I'll post it again this week. So if you guys want to go back and figure something out or, and all, and all of this, is in your readings at nauseum if you so are interested. So anyway, um, if you have no other questions or anything, we will gather again next Tuesday. We will talk about common rail fuel systems and we should be able to get through common rail on Tuesday and uh, hopefully get into turbochargers on, uh, on leave the fuel systems alone and get into turbochargers on uh, Thursday. Okay? Cool. You guys all good? All right. Sounds good. All right. Then we will uh, see you on Tuesday.
And uh, there's, remember, there's three tests involved in here. And I think, didn't I push, I think I, I think I, put, I posted a new, I posted a new web base too, um, I think. So there's ultimately going to be four of them. So I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Thank you. All right. All right. Have a good one. Bye.